something about the flowers uh, downstairs and in the narthex. The beautiful flowers are placed here by friends and family of Lynn McElwain. It's been a, a year since she went home to be with the Lord. and uh, I know I speak for the family. We miss her and uh, continue to uh, undergird uh, Riley and Anna and Patrick in our and we are very thankful for the beautiful flowers. We've got some flowers up here. I do want to uh, make a note here. Uh, <clears throat> these are placed uh, in honor of Landon Bolden's birthday by his grandparents, Joe and Debbie. Uh, are they here? Is Landon here? Hey, Landon, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, I guess it's your birthday. Is that right? Wednesday, okay. But there's something unique about these flowers. You, you probably can't see it. And when I, I got here this morning, I, I usually bring the, get the flowers and bring them up here. And these flowers are red and blue. And in the <laughs> middle, there's a football. <laughs> and I thought when I saw that, uh, I knew who they were for. And I thought, well, there's been a mix-up, you know. And... So if I'm wrong, uh, that's, you know, that's fine. It, I didn't know if Landon was uh, a football fan, but it's got beautiful ribbon here, and it says, Go Ole Miss. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it really should say, Go Mississippi State after last <laughs> night. But Landon, if, if uh, you got, uh, if these flowers did accidentally get, uh, confused or misplaced. Uh, I hope you're an Ole Miss fan. Uh, anyway, uh, we appreciate the flowers being placed here. Jamie, you want to make an announcement? <laughs> Sorry. Um, tonight is see, uh, Saw You at the Pole. Um, Wednesday, See You at the Pole. We're actually doing Saw You at the Pole first. Um, the kids are going to meet here at 5.30. We're going to go over to the Interactive Center. It starts at 6. It should be over 7, 7.15-ish. You can either pick your kids up at the Interactive Center or I'll bring the van back here uh, after it's over, which would be, I would guess, at the latest 7.30. So. You got a bake sale next Sunday? Bake sale next Sunday. Um, so don't eat breakfast. Um, come hungry. It'll be... <laughs> We've got some pretty good cooks. Will with, it be uh, before, after church? After church, after church, like we usually do, it'll be right down in the lobby. Um, so as you're leaving the church, you can, you know, on your way to lunch, grab some dessert, <laughs> you know, get that. And uh, for the parents, the youth parents, I've got some calendars. I will be emailing these out also. But if your uh, child is in youth, see me, and I'll get you a calendar of some upcoming stuff. Some of you got a letter from me, accidentally, by mistake this week, saying you're invited to a meeting this afternoon, a uh, leadership committee, and uh, you shouldn't have gotten that letter. Okay? Now, if you look at your bulletin, uh, we do have a committee on lay leadership nomination this afternoon at 2 o'clock in the activities room, and those who are on that committee, your names are listed right there. So, uh, if you got a letter and your name is not listed here at the top, please don't come. I don't want you to miss a nap or whatever <laughs> this afternoon, but if your name is on this committee, two o'clock in the activities room. And I'm gonna say one more thing then you can share. Uh, this afternoon at 6 o'clock here in the sanctuary, we're showing the movie God's Not Dead. This was a major hit as far as a Christian movie all around this nation. Uh, a lot of people 
got to see it, but a lot of people didn't get to see it. And if you didn't get to see it, you need to see it. It will, it will bless you in a very special way. Six o'clock tonight here. Uh, there's no charge. Bring the family. We are not serving popcorn and cold drinks <laughs> as been advertised, but you will enjoy the movie anyway. Okay? At uh, 2 o'clock today is the funeral of Frances Prophet. Uh, many of you uh, know her. She's, she's been, her home has been River Chase for the last several years. Um, but the funeral is at Holder Wells at 2 o'clock today. Um, I did want to mention about the um, tutors, and last week we had in there readers. Uh, it's that time of year when students come knocking or teachers come knocking and saying, we need help with our students. So if, if you can give an hour um, a week to help out with uh, Frank, with the tutors, or to help us at Central Elementary with readers, uh, come and see us and let us know that you're available and we'll get that lined out. Thank you. Again, we're delighted to have all of you here. Uh, we're in the fall of the year now, as I understand it. It's cooling down just a little bit. And God provided another beautiful Sunday for us together. Now, uh, let's invite him to be present in all that we do, okay? Father, uh, we just, we come to thank you. We come to bless you. We come to hear you uh, say a word of encouragement that will increase our faith and increase our hope and trust in you. Lord Jesus, everything that we do here is always about you. So come, in the name of the Holy Spirit, come. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. The Protestant Reformation was founded on the idea that worship is not something that the congregation observes being done, that it's something that happens within us, all of us. This little chorus that we know very well is very short. I invite you to sing it and use it as a way to prepare your heart to receive God and to listen to the words that you'll hear this morning. Let's stand, please. Methodist hymnal, at least back as far as 1932, as I checked, but it's appeared in a lot of other hymnals. It's called Living for Jesus, and it goes along with pastor's message this morning, so you may recognize it. If you don't, please do your best. We've got four verses. We're going to do them all, and let's use these words, tear our hearts for the message.
faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thus he come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Christina, for their moment, they would make their way. 
This morning. Good. Try again. How are you this morning? Good. Very good. Thank you, Addison. Um, parents, I wanted to mention tonight while y'all are watching God's Not Dead, we'll be on the other side watching Mercy Rules and we'll also have a nursery. So, we had a good week? We had a good week? Have you ever said to your mom or dad, that's not fair? Probably five, six times a day. Yeah, I know. You say it all the time. That's not fair. He got more ice cream than I did. That's not fair. He gets to stay up later than I do. You said that before? That's what you... That's what I say. I know that's not fair, but he's older than you. Or that's not fair. He ate all his vegetables. Right? Well, I want to tell you a story in, from the book of Matthew. It's a story Jesus told, and it was about a man who owned a vineyard, and he went and hired some people to come work for him. He hired some in the morning, then again at noon he hired some more, and at the end of the day he hired another set of people to come work. Well, at the end of the day when it was time to pay them, he paid them all the same. What do you think the people that worked all day long said? What do you think they said? Yeah, there we go. That's not fair. I worked all day long. He only worked an hour. Why are you paying him the same? Well, the man that owned the vineyard said, I paid you what I told you I was going to pay you. Why are you so upset that I'm being generous? Are you jealous of my generosity? You know, that leads us to ask, is God fair? Of course he is. Very good, Addison. There we go. Of course he is. He's always fair. You know, if he wasn't fair, would we be going to heaven? No. 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 Jesus loved us so much, a real true love, that he sent his son to die so that we could all join him in heaven. If we got really what we deserved, we would not go to heaven, would we? But because we were loved so much, God made a way for us to come to him. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for loving us so very much that you sent your son to give us everlasting life. We are so grateful to all that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all ready to go over? Yeah. Who really wants it? to come forward now for the receiving of our tithes and our offerings. Father, we have been blessed this morning. Blessed by your presence. Blessed by the gifts of your children the music, the message. Lord, it lifts us closer to you. And now we have opportunity to give out of that blessing. May our offerings uh, bring glory to you and expand your kingdom for your sake. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
seated. As we enter this uh, time of prayer, let's be mindful of those who are on our concern list who have asked us to pray. I mentioned that um, Frances Prophet uh, is funerals today, so let's remember her family. Um, uh, also, um, Clarence and Alice Lindsay's grandson, Trip Roy, has been in the hospital and uh, is, is doing better, but I know the family would appreciate prayers for that little fella. Are there any other concerns that we have not brought before the body? That's Barbara Carpenter. Uh, Brother Jim said that she had her surgery, and now they go back uh, for the report on the biopsy. So let's remember Harry and Barbara in our prayers. Jamie? Yes. Tonight and then on Wednesday uh, with our youth, that this be an important time for them. Okay. Anita's asking us to please keep Keith Belcher in our prayers. He's still undergoing more tests. Um, so let's remember that request as well. Okay, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and make our requests known to him. Lord, when we quiet our hearts, you make yourself known. Think of your word that says, be still and know that I am God. Lord, we look to you as our refuge, our strength, our strong tower. We weren't meant to go it alone because your promise is that you are with us always. And in times of trial and testing, all the more you make your presence known as we look to you. So for all these concerns that are before us and for these concerns lifted today. We pray for your presence to surround every situation. For those that have been voiced and those that are unspoken. Father, have your way in us, through us. May we see your hand at work as we put our trust in you. And Lord, coming up this week is the challenge across this nation to be in a 40-day season of prayer. Lord, may our hearts be joined as one as we 
pray together for this nation. That we pray that men's hearts and eyes will be opened to see you as our authority. Lord, we pray that you would be with our leaders and those who stand in the gap for those who are holding up truth. Lord, have mercy on this nation. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It seems there are wars on every side. But you've asked us to pray. And so we pray for your will to be done. And Father, as we continue to seek you and to learn from you, may we join in confidence the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yeah, that was good, wasn't it? I wish all of you could have been with me last Sunday night and our cluster sing. I'm telling you, the music, the singing was great. We sang with enthusiasm like United Methodists should sing. I know we made John Wesley proud. And that spirit was provided by the Holy Spirit. We sang with one voice, praising God for all of his blessings, praising God for the gift of his church, and praising God for the gift of eternal life in Jesus Christ. And I know I'm a little prejudiced, but I think our choir led the way. I think our choir 
Set the example for that singing. Rejoice. Rejoice. I want to share with you some words that Paul wrote to his to the church that he founded in Philippi from his letter to the Philippian church beginning in verse 1, excuse me, chapter 1, in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. That sounds like a good sentence, doesn't it? Paul's in jail. Now you wouldn't normally think that being in prison would advance the gospel. But you got to know Paul. Paul was just looking for an opportunity to tell people about Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. As a result, it became clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Then he goes on to say, but that's not always true. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and robbery, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm here in chains. But what does that matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, that Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. In, the, in other words, it will turn out for his good. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now here's the key verses I want you to see. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. <coughs> the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Paul is in prison. He is writing to the church at Philippi. And it's not unusual for Paul to write letters. In fact, several of the letters that we have in the New Testament are what we call <coughs> excuse me, prison letters. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you this morning that some of the greatest letters ever written came from prison. Martin Luther's King's letter from a Birmingham jail. If you've never read that, you ought to do yourself a favor. Especially if you went through the civil rights era. Especially if you're a Christian and, and, and you've suffered for well, whatever cause, but you, the cause was for Jesus Christ. It's a fabulous letter. Then there was a, 
a wonderful letter written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a Lutheran pastor, written from a Nazi concentration camp during World War II, and the letter was smuggled out by German guards. That little book, perhaps a hundred pages, has caused a revolution in the church and how to deal with the world in modern day times. And then, probably 200 years before Bonhoeffer wrote his letter, there was another Christian preacher by the name of John Bunyan who wrote Grace Abounding. And he wrote it from a prison cell. It's a very touching and moving letter about how God can bring up the rear, even if the rear is in prison, with a spirit of joy, rejoice, rejoice. But St. Paul is credited with writing the first prison letters. And this morning we're taking a look at the one he wrote from a, from a Roman cell. Now, Paul tells us that he was securely fastened, as it were, to the Praetorian Guard. The Praetorian Guard was made up of about 100 Roman guards. They were always dressed in their battle dress. And Paul found himself chained to one or two of those guards almost every day for months. But now he's writing to his favorite church. You know, uh, when I was in seminary, we were told many times, pastors do not play favorites. It will get you in trouble. And it probably got Paul in trouble, but this was his favorite church. After all, he founded this church. And there he had developed a, a very loving and caring and deep relationship. And in this letter, Paul's thanking his church family for all their prayers and for their thoughtfulness. In fact, Paul tells us in his letter that the church at Philippi is sending a, a, a Christian convert by the name of Epiroditus. Now, how would you like to be named Epiroditus? Here, yeah, Epiroditus! Well, that was his name, and that's who they sent. And he had a gift for Paul, expressing their love for him. But Paul doesn't tell us what kind of gift he received. You know what kind of gift I think he got? I think he got a chocolate cake, <laughs> maybe with a file in it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be appropriate, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I mean, you know, prisoners didn't eat well uh, in any uh, prison they were attending or locked down to. So maybe the, the gift that they sent was maybe a chocolate cake with a file or two to, in case he wanted to get out. At any rate, Paul is writing them, thanking them for his gift. His words that he shares with them reaped with thanksgiving and joy and love. Listen to them. I thank God for all of you I'm always praying for you and giving thanks for each of you. I hold you in my heart. Now that's a mark of a, of a pastor holding his people in his heart because we are partners, Paul says, of the same grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of the gospel. Even in his time of deep need, the church at Philippi was right there. They never left him. And he concludes with these words. Oh, how I yearn for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And brothers and sisters, this is an amazing letter. How does Paul, who's facing death every day, how does he find the joy and the enthusiasm, the faith and the spirit to thank God? Most people would be bitter. Few of us would have the faith 
and the Spirit to write words like this, but he does, for I know for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't know. I, maybe I would have written something like this. Come get me out of this place. <laughs> I w once remember reading a story about Woody Allen and what kind of funeral that he had requested. He responded this way. He said, I want all my friends to gather around my coffin and do everything to bring me back to life. <laughs> and I thought, Woody, Jesus Christ can take care of that for you. Paul was writing to his friend about what it means to live one's life in faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. He said, I want to go home to be with Jesus. But for your sake, I'll stay a little bit long. Well, I thought, you know, I've never been in jail. I was reading this last night about 9 o'clock. And I thought, uh-oh. I shouldn't, I, I, I shouldn't say that, that I've never been in jail, because I, I have been in jail two times. Not for serious crimes of any uh, reason, and certainly not for any length of time. And I, and I certainly wasn't worried about dying while I was in prison, although I was probably closer to death than I realized when my father found out that I was in jail. <laughs> I want to go home to be with Jesus, but for your sake, I'll stay with you as long as I can. Let me tell you what I think Paul wants the church to hear then and today. That there's a much greater awareness that life is not just about the here and now. Let me say that again. Paul wants us to understand that there's more in life than what we experience here and now, that God has a plan, an eternal plan. And that plan is so much greater, so much larger than your life or my life. I think that's why Paul is inviting us to always give thanks, no matter what we are experiencing, even when we are suffering or even that we might be chained to some experience or circumstance that brings forth trials and sufferings, or maybe we're chained to someone who's making life unbearable for us. That with Christ Jesus, there's always reason to be thankful. Amen? Amen? Amen. With Christ Jesus, there is always reason to give thanks, even when we might be suffering. And I know that a lot of you already know that. You've already learned that truth, that you can find God's joy even in the midst of difficult times. Because you know, without a doubt, that you belong to Jesus. And nobody in the world can change that reality. I believe that Paul knew this in his mind. Now listen to me. I believe that Paul knew this in his mind. I believe that Paul preached that in his preaching. But something happened over the years of his missionary journey. Now Paul knows this in his heart. He was having a heartwarming experience of joy with the Holy Spirit. I believe the same type of heartwarming experience that John Wesley had back in the middle 1700s as he was going to a Bible study that Charles, I believe, was leading. John Wesley had been preaching in England. He had been over here in America. He had it up here. He had it in his words, but he didn't 
yet the Holy Spirit got a hold of John Wesley, and John Wesley got a hold of the Church of England, and the world hasn't been the same since. With this in mind, Paul writes in his letters that he has three alternatives, three options, as it were. Listen to what they might be, have been, or what they were. First, he says that he can be released and come back to Philippi to visit his church family. Now, he's, not, he's really not ruling this option out because he, know, he knows that God has his future in his hands. Does God have your future in, your hand, in his hands? Maybe Paul was remembering when he and Silas were back in Philippi in prison. You find that story in Acts chapter 16. They're having a revival in prison. They're having prayer meetings. And they're singing and they're rejoicing. Maybe the singing was as spirit-filled as it was at East Lawn last Sunday night. I hope so. I know it was, at least to some extent, because it got the old jailer's attention. He'd thrown people in jail for years, but he never heard them singing and thanking God that they were in prison. And Paul may have been writing this, that he was going to get out of jail <laughs> because he remembered how God unlocked the jail there at Philippi, bringing an earthquake, and that old jail just shook under that earthquake and the doors opened up and Paul and Silas and I suspect a few other would-be criminals walked out of that prison. But not before Paul and Silas stopped to pray and to lead the old jailer to Jesus Christ. <laughs> he says, That's, I, I'm coming to see you and I, it won't be long, it'll be soon. See, brothers and sisters, we can say things like that when we understand that God not only has our todays in his hand, he's got our future in his hands as well. And with God holding the future, anything, anything can happen. I remember a few couple of years ago uh, around Christmas, and I don't remember laying on the floor, but I was somewhere here. God had my future in his hands. And he still does. Talk about singing a song of thanksgiving. Man, wow! Secondly, Paul knows that his plans of maybe being released from prison might not happen the way he would like for it to happen. He says, that's okay. That's okay with me if I don't get out of jail because there's enough work for me to do as long as I'm alive right here where I am. Paul finds himself, <laughs> I love this, Paul finds himself chained to prison guards. My friends, that is a preacher's dream. <laughs> they can't leave. They can't go to sleep. He's got them right where he wants them and he shares the gospel with gusto as he tells them about the difference that Jesus Christ can make in your life that no matter what is chaining and holding you down you can look at it with joy and thanksgiving because God's got you under in his hand. You may not be where you want to be today. And your plans for the future may seem to be on hold. I, I'm saying this to everybody, but I especially want our young people to hear this. You may feel like you're not going anywhere. In fact, you're going further away from your plan. So what do you do? 
For Paul's telling you what you do. You trust in God. Looking for something positive that's happening in your life right now. And give thanks for those things. You see, God might have plans for you to be right where you are right now. You don't want to be there. You want to be over here, but you're over here. But God, this is where God wants you right now. You can't see any good from being over here, but God knows that he's getting ready to use you to do something great for his kingdom. You just can't see it. That's where trust and faith, that God's got you today and God's got you tomorrow in his hand. So keep trusting. Keep looking for opportunities to serve the Lord Jesus Christ right where you are because you don't know what's coming down the road. And that's not just for young people. That's for all you old people out there too. And then last, the third alternative was that Paul would die. Doesn't sound like much of an alternative, does it? But brothers and sisters, Paul just told us that to be with Christ is better than to be here. Are you with me? We, we have bought into the world's view that dying is something horrible And the Word of God tells us hundreds of times that's not the truth. It's not a death, it's not a step down, it's a step up. And yes, God created us in His image to live life to the fullest, to get the most out of every day that we can, and we need to do that. Don't be afraid of dying because Paul has told us that what God has in store for us in heaven, it, it can't even compare to the best of life here on earth. It's better, far better than anything that we will experience here. And if we can have that kind of faith then our lives should be lived with a higher purpose and meaning and faith than if we don't have that kind of faith. We live today as we want to die tomorrow, looking to Jesus, knowing that he is going to bring us from this life into the next. Again, Paul writes, for me to live is Christ to die is gain. And what empower? What, what did Paul believe that gave him that power? I, I, as you look at Paul's writings, Paul writes and says more about the power of the resurrection than all the other New Testament writers together. For Paul, the resurrection was central. He wanted to read it, his readers and his listeners to understand that without the power of the resurrection, without the resurrection. Life really doesn't hold meaning for anyone. There is no power without the resurrection. And it's the resurrection that should guide our life, that should sustain our day-to-day -day living. It should be something that we hope for both now and in the coming future. For Paul, it was, it was like a horizon. Always in front of him. Always something that he could focus on. It brought him renewed power and strength and a firm trust that no matter what he might be chained to, that didn't, inf that didn't have any bearing on his trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Because he believed without a doubt that his life was fully in the hands. How about us? Have you ever experienced the power and the hope that can be yours in Jesus Christ? Brothers and sisters, is your faith strong enough to be able to sing with the Apostle Paul for me to live is Christ and to die is gain? 
Let me close with this. Most of you know um, the story of my mom and where she is. She's 95 years old, living in a nursing home in Gallatin, Tennessee. She's chained to Alzheimer's. And that's a horrible disease. She doesn't know her family. She doesn't know where she is. But I believe in all my heart that her faith in Jesus Christ is still just as firm as it always was. And we, we go to see her, we pray for her. We, we might even sing songs to her. When we celebrate the good things that Jesus is doing in our family, a smile comes on mom's face. I know she understands that. Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. This is my mom's favorite verse. I grew up in a, in a house. I heard this 10,000 times. I, I, Dad might come home and take his belt off and whip me for doing something <laughs> that I, I knew I sh shouldn't have done. And Mama would be over there smiling. And she'd say, son, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident for all, to all, for the Lord is near. That's the key that unlocks the faith like Paul. That's the key that unlocks our faith, believing that no matter what, no matter what you might be chained to, a person or circumstance, a situation in life that seems like it's going downhill. There's no hope. With Jesus Christ, there's always, always hope. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. Listen to this. You know Paul wrote this. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your mind and your heart in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, that gets it all. Your mind and your heart. That peace that passes all understanding that can allow us to rejoice and sing with enthusiasm, thank you, Lord Jesus, for being who you are. Thank you for your blessings of life. Thank you for the cross and the empty tomb. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our closing hymn comes almost entirely from God's Word, paraphrased, paraphrased rather, uh, by the lyricist. Let's stand, please. And sing together.
Jesus.